adjourn, but that's not a signal to leave for anyone who just slipped out the door. Um, my name is Rebecca McPhail. I'm the president of the West Virginia Manufacturers Association, and I see a lot of faces out there that have stuck with us for the last day and a half, and we really appreciate that. Um, we appreciate our sponsors who are here this afternoon, um, and we appreciate Ted Abernathy. Um, I had the pleasure last summer of attending a Southern Governors Association, uh, National Association of Manufacturers joint consortium on manufacturing for the southern states and to hear uh, Ted speak for the first time. As managing partner of the Economic Leadership LLC, um, Ted serves as a policy advisor for the Southern Governors Association. As an economic futurist, uh, Ted speaks to more than 100 groups each year on topics ranging from leadership to global trends impacting competitiveness, um, which makes me think he might be the original TED Talk, possibly. And um, I'd, I'd like for you to join me in welcoming Ted as he presents to us this afternoon. I was going to go use the stairs, but I got embarrassed. Everybody else hopped up over here. so. Um, I don't have a bad toe today, so I guess I should do that. It'd be all right. <laughs> bad knees, but not bad toes. Uh, our firm does a, a lot of trend work. I was an economic developer for about uh, 30 years. I used to run the Research Triangles economic development programs, and then ran off and uh, ran the Southern Growth Policy Board, which is a think tank for Southern governors and, and legislators. And we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what's around the next corner. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. We're going to take about 25 minutes of your time. We're going to start with the economy, and then we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about the future. And what Rebecca asked me to deal with today is is how do you stay competitive or get competitive after listening to everybody sort of bemoan your competitiveness this morning? How do you get competitive in a world that's changing so fast that it's hard to know where we're where we're heading next? Now I'll start out by saying I don't have anything profound to say to you. It's not going to be a profound day, except that most of the things we used to think we knew we knew just aren't true anymore. If I look around the room, there's enough gray hair like mine to have had a different paradigm of what we thought was truth at one point in time. Um, so I'm from North Carolina, and my favorite philosopher is Mike Tyson. I know, y'all can look down your nose. My wife's family is from Davis originally in West Virginia, so I can do West Virginia jokes too with her family. But uh, in North Carolina, Mike Tyson's my favorite philosopher. How many of you know Mike Tyson quotes? Mike Tyson's best quote is that everybody has a plan till they get hit in the mouth. It's his best quote. And, uh, and we were kind of cruising along through the 70s and 80s and 90s in America thinking, you know, we're the biggest, baddest people on the block. And then we got punched, and the punch was change. The world started changing on us. And, you know, we can go all the way back and do, you know, you know, the wall comes down in Eastern Europe, and China opens up their markets, and India liberal. There's a bunch of things that changes, and technology shifted, and the whole world started changing. And we've had trouble. When, you know, if you do psychological tests, about two-thirds of you in the room would dislike change. It's not one of the things we like doing, right? How, how many people like change? Raise your hand. See, look, that, that's about right. And psychologists would tell you about two-thirds of people just hate change. And yet we're in a world today where change is accelerating. In 1957, Peter Drucker, and I'm, I was born in 1957, so you can see that number up here a few times today. Peter Drucker, who's probably the smartest business guy ever, said that we were entering an era where everybody born at the turn of the century, and he meant 1900, had never been at, had a time where change wasn't rapid. This is 1957, and you sort of think about 1957. My favorite slide is the one down here. It says the Houston Society of All-Female Engineers. There's about 12 of them in the whole city in 1957. I, I looked like that in 1957, first year, you know. 57 is forever ago, right? And yet we were, we were already bemoaning the fact that change was there. Anybody here re remember reading Future Shock? Right? You can get a copy of it for about 50 cents now on eBay. And, uh, but Toffler had a lot of things right. He, he, he predicted a great deal of the stuff we had. This is 1971. And what he said in 1971 is that we're entering a time where the pace of change is so fast that physically we can't keep up with it. Now, all right, for those of you who can do this, remember 1971 for a second. I mean, 1970, there, there's no, I mean, luggage didn't have wheels in 1971. There was no such thing as light beer in 1971. 
there was nothing you could put in your hand and press that would cause anything to happen around you in 1971. No computers. And we thought that speed then was so fast that it would cause us psychological and physical harm. So think about today, and you wonder why everybody's sort of grumpy all the time. And one of the reasons is we can't seem to get our footing. Today, the world, the economy has changed dramatically, and we'll talk about a little of that. Place-based competition, what used to make West Virginia or any place competitive, isn't the same set of things anymore. The world's changed on competition. What it means to be successful corporately has changed. Any bankers in the room? A banker in 1980 thought 4% profit was pretty good. Today, if you don't have 15% profit, you're not even in the game. And yet, what we, what we think of as success is just completely different, and the pace of change just keeps getting faster. So let me ask you for a couple things today. Well, I'm going to ask you to vote on a How's the economy, and I want you to give it a grade, uh, national economy first, A, B, C, D, F. So the national economy, how many people think it gets an A grade? A B? B, C? More? D? F. West Virginia, A, B, C, D, F. Your local community, wherever you're based, A, B, F, U, C, D, F. Now, all of that, y'all are pessimistic, right? You can you tell in the room, not, not so good. But I want you to think for just a second, what did you just measure in your head? I mean, what did you think of when we talked about, when we said economy? Because... I can show you a long list of things that show that the U.S. is having as good as anybody in the world economy. A lot of things look great if you look at the national economy. A whole group of things don't look great. So when you're head, somebody tell me what you, somebody who gave the national economy a D, tell me what you were thinking. Come on. What, what was the factor in your head that gave it a D? Job growth. Okay, something else. Regulatory suffocation. Regulatory suffocation. So from an economist standpoint, not really the economy, more public policy, but okay. Might be, the, might be what you think caused it. Might be what you think caused it. What else was the economy? GDP, that's good. You got jobs and GDP, that's two of the ones you almost always get. The, the worst one is the third one. What is it? Not taxes typically, because you can have high or low taxes and the economy would be different, but wages. Most people, when you talk to them about why they're so messed up about the economy, it's because wage growth has been pretty stagnant. So we'll talk about all of those things, but when we think about economy, we've got to be thinking about something. And some people talk about innovation, and some people talk about uh, inequity, and some people talk about lots of things when they think about the economy. But when you have these discussions with people about how's the economy, most of the time you're having a discussion between two people who aren't measuring things the same way. It's a little bit like saying, you know, using one of those factors that says, well, how fat are you? And if you use the national model of how skinny you ought to be, then, you know, 98% of us in the room are fat. And you say, well, yeah, but that's not the way I think about it. I think about my brother, Earl, who's twice my size. Now, he's fat. You know, so it's, it's relative. So let's talk about the economy for just a minute. And I'm going to give you some data because... You know, without data, you're just another guy with an opinion, right? So we'll do a little data, and we'll start globally, and there's a couple reasons. One is that uh, in the world today, half the people on the planet live inside that circle, and the other half live everywhere else. And so when you start thinking about the economy of the world, you've got to think about you in context. So let's look at global unemployment, what's happened over the last four years as we come out of the recession, and the rest of the world. And you, and you see, the U.S. unemployment rate, and if anybody wants to argue what unemployment rates, whether the U3 or the U6 or the whatever, we can argue that after, I promise. This is the unemployment rate that everybody's been using for 40 years, and it's just, and it's the one generally used around the world. And the U.S. unemployment's come down from 9% to about 4.9. We can talk about, if you'd like, what, what type of utilization curves there are inside that. But everybody, if you look at Europe, which is about our size, during that same period, Europe's unemployment rate actually went up. 
Look at Russia's. Look at Brazil's up. What we've got is a world where we've got somewhere around a half a billion more people looking for work than we currently have jobs. Now, for those of you who went to economic school for the first day, maybe you dropped a class day two, but the first day, what did they tell you about supply, demand, and price? So we got more people than we need looking for jobs. What happens to wage rates? They go down, right? So why is it that we have flat wage rates around the world? We got too much labor right now. I'm not, that's not a value judgment. That's just, again, that's just math. When we look at projected GDP, what it's been and what it's projected from 2013 to uh, from 2013 to 2016, U.S. GDP next year is nothing to be particularly happy about. It's about 2%. But if you look around the world, if you look at Japan, it hadn't gotten back to 1% after 20 years. If you look at Europe, it's about one and a half. If you look at Brazil and Russia, two of the BRIC countries that we were supposed to be so afraid of, they're both in deep recessions right now. China thinks it's uh, telling us it's at 64 you know, most people think three somethings probably right. India has a new government that's caused theirs to bump, but overall global unemployment or global GDP, when we projected and nationally the economics projected in September 2011 where we'd be today, they thought global growth at five percent, and then every six months, people dialed it back and dialed it back and dialed it back, and so now. The forecast is global growth just over 3%. So we're in a world today where growth is pretty slow. So we got too many people looking for work. We got a slow global growth field. And what does that tell you is going to happen to the U.S. economy? This is the good times. For the short run, this is as fast as we're going to grow. And we can throw up, you know, 42 slides about what Democrats say and what Republicans I work for, for both groups. I, I don't care about politics because most of the time that doesn't have any impact on economics. What's happening around the world has more impact than what your local policies are. Consumer prices, been low in, in the U.S., very low inflation. Look at the places who are in recession, very high inflation. Now, you can get to the point where that inflation, you know, the, the Fed would like that to be about 2%, and we've been below that for a long time, so not always healthy. And everybody in the world wants to grow faster, so everybody's spending more money than they've got. If you look at the U.S., we were spending 9.1% more uh, a few years ago. We're still spending 2.4% more. By, by the way, China's spending 3% more than they have. So if you want to know who's running a bigger deficit right now, I mean, you probably win a bar bet in, in somewhere in West Virginia on China. Fact is, we've all tried to stimulate. It hadn't changed. There's been stimulation going on by everybody in the Western world for a long time. And we haven't been able to jumpstart the economy. So they're very, we can't get interest rates any lower and we can't get stimulus any higher. And so you're really looking at a, a situation where the economics are what they are, with the U.S. outperforming most of the world. When you look at job growth in the U.S., the last two years have been the best two years since the late 90s. So whoever gave the U.S. job growth a D means that you've been unhappy for about 20 years, right? I mean, the last two years have been really strong. This year, the first two months, um, I don't know why the February number's not showing, It's but a little over 200,000. So, you know, it, we actually expect growth to be slower this year but the last few two years have been pretty good job growth. They haven't been even job growth. And the quality of the jobs and things like that we can argue about, but pretty strong job growth. When you look at, ignore the slide title, because I did this I did this off a of slide thing that we did for all the southern states, I took them all out and put people around you. You know, around you, right now, West Virginia is the only place that lost jobs over the last 12 months. So the U.S. grew by 1.8 percent. Virginia had a better year. Virginia had very slow growth a year ago because of sequestration, but came back pretty strong. But if you look, none of those are excitable. I mean, if you're running, if you're growing at under 2%, you're not going to go have a party about it. But West Virginia has had a tough year. And so when you start looking at where that is, we look at all the sectors for you. And construction is the big area. You're not building a lot of new things in West Virginia right now. But even business and professional services has been down a bit. Leisure and hospitality down, where they, both of those are up big around the country. 
Government growth has, has you're, you're losing government jobs. The rest of the country started adding some back. So overall, it's a broad base of the economy that's relatively weak. And if you look, this is a, uh, this is a chart that shows the U.S. every year's job growth overlaid with West Virginia's, and you are in the red. And what you can see, if you overlay every state in the country on here, what you find is that every state, no matter who they are, no matter who's in office, no matter whatever, follows a, a pattern of the national economy, and the national economy follows a pattern of the global economy. So you can see that you guys have been pretty close to the line for a long time, except that you see during the recession you did a little better than the rest of the country, that's that big dip, but you haven't, haven't had a good run the last couple of years, and you all know why. This is natural resources and mining overlaid with job growth nationally for natural resources and mining. So the country's had a drop, but you've had a huge drop. And some of that is oil and some of this, and this goes through September of 15. So that's a big area. Manufacturing even more closely follows national economies and it does for every state. And yours did too, and you can see there's been an uptick, but slightly less than the nation. And normally that's not the policies of the state, it's normally the industry mix in the state. So if you're in an industry mix that's growing, you're gonna have a better time, and if you're in an industry mix that's not growing, you have a little less time. But overall, manufacturing growth follows the U.S. economy very closely. Looking at wages, you can see uh, for West Virginia, wages have been all over the map. In the late uh, 2000s, your wages spiked while everybody else was going down. That's natural resources. And you can see now that the pattern is very close. If you look at uh, mining jobs, up and around and sort of all over the place, but, uh, but following a national pattern. And if you look at manufacturing jobs, you tend to be a little behind the nation. So it happens a quarter later here, but very close pattern. So wages in manufacturing and growth in manufacturing in the state, you saw that you had a zero growth, I think, in the last 12 months after a couple years, but nationally, manufacturing had a rough two quarters in the last part of last year, so everybody constricted a little. A lot of states, Texas lost manufacturing jobs in, in the last year. You would be outperforming Texas in manufacturing. When you start talking about the competitiveness, and this is something, we're going to do this fast today, but we do about uh, 600 metrics on every state measuring everybody else. And we do them in big charts, and so when you think about what is it that causes you to be competitive or not competitive, this is what corporate CEOs tell you are the most important factors for them deciding where they put stuff. Number one, skilled labor. If your labor's highly skilled, you, you do great. Highway accessibility, quality of life issues. Quality of life issues, by the way, typically are crime issues, health issues, housing issues, and public education. Those four things make up quality of life. Occupancy costs, buildings, labor, corporate tax rate, incentives, tax exemption, fast rate, all the way down. Energy availability and cost is there. If you ask site selection consultants, who's bringing projects, skilled labor number one, labor costs, they have a few other things, but generally we know what it is that causes a state to be competitive or not. One of the things that talks about a lot is taxes. So here's all the southern states on a tax chart, and taxes aren't one thing. There's corporate, there's individual, there's sales, there's property. On this chart, I don't know why we're lower, looks good on my slide. Let's see, you guys are down at the bottom, sorry about that, so it must be a, a framing thing. Let me tell you where you are. You are all on white, which means you're in the middle of every tax thing. I don't know why it's off the chart, but uh, you're the mid, so you are 15 to 25 on every tax rating. You're not, you're not high, you're not low. Your tax rates are about in line. There you go, I don't know what happened there. There you go, 20, 21 to, 16 to 25, not bad, it was a good guess on my part. Uh, one of the things that we, we don't think about is sometimes we say, well, is Texas a high tax state or a low tax state? And everybody goes, a low tax state. Well, Texas is individual income taxes in the top 10 lowest, but their corporate tax is in the top 10 highest, and their sales tax. So when you start thinking taxes, it's a measurement thing. So if you really want to know how the tax burden is in a state, you look at the tax burden by industry. That's another whole way of doing it, but you can be a great tax state for R&D facilities and a horrible tax state for manufacturing. So you gotta get past those kind of numbers. So when you start looking at competitiveness, dig deeper. So a bunch of trends that are sort of changing how all of this work, and these are my grandparents. 
Now, there, this is 1957. I've been told this is the day I came home from the hospital. I do not know why my grandfather has a gun in his pants. I don't. So if you ask me that question, I, my mother's still alive. I asked. She doesn't know why he had his gun. Why he's packing that day. I have no idea. And uh, again, if uh, this is Janora over here, if you need a girl's name that hasn't been used lately, I don't believe I've met any Janora since my grandmother. But, um, but this is what the world was like 50 years ago. They were all from itty bitty towns. Alexis in Dallas, North Carolina. They all four were first generation textile workers in the textile mills. Nobody ever had a foreign car, ever rode an airplane. Margaret would tell you that people really couldn't fly. That was just all a myth. That you could actually get a, I fly 120 days a year, so I don't know how my, how my mama would think about that. But that was what the world was like then. Well, today, the world got different. And one of the biggest differences is urbanization. People are moving in vast numbers to bigger and bigger cities. If you look at the data, non-metro places are having really much slower growth and in some cases negative growth. We, new population number, North Carolina has 100 counties, so it's easy to count. Yesterday, the new population growth came out, 48 of the counties had lost population. I mean, that's sort of the model we're in today. So you're, you're living in a world where people move more and more and you can see around this, you see the big tan area up there. If you're tan, you're losing population. Well, you can see where y'all are on this map. But lots of places losing population. And a few places in the dark blue gaining a lot of people. This is the map that normally makes the point for me. Half of Americans live in the blue counties. The other half live in the gray. So we have you know, over 3,000 counties, and half of the US voters and people live in 146 of them. And this is accelerating. It's not going the other way. So when you look at where people are moving around the country, and you look from since 2000, people are moving in vast numbers to the south. Y'all can tell me whether you think you're the south or not in a minute. You know, you're on some south things and others not. My wife swears Maryland's in the South. She's from there. I tell her there's no sweet tea. She can't be in the South. Doesn't count. <laughs> Done. They got Lithuanian restaurants and no sweet tea. It's not the South. I've been married 33 years. Fight continues. But if you're not South or West, you're losing population, right? And if you're young and educated, if you look at the 1970s all the way through the last decade, if you're young and educated, you are much, much more likely now to be moving to cities, not even to suburbs, to cities. If you're 25 to 34 years old, you're four times as likely to move into a town, in a big city, as you are even to move into the suburbs of that city. So West Virginia is in a position, you know, when you think about this, so what? Well, you know, your biggest metro area is 300 and some thousand. Is that right? That sound right? I mean, 250. So. So the, I, I live in little old Raleigh, North Carolina. It doesn't sound very big, right? Little old Raleigh, North Carolina's metro area is 1.9 million. It's bigger than the state. And so you're competing up. Now, that doesn't mean you can't win, but it means that your urban areas have to compete with other urban areas for new talent. Demographics continue to reshape our country. If you want to be a futurist, get into the demography world, you can always tell how old you're going to be five years from now. It's really great predicting, it's good. We've been saying that we've been, the two things we've been saying in America for a long time is that we're browning, and you can decide if you like that terminology or not, but we're getting less white, and you can see that this is absolutely true, and the math shows it. Right now, the expectation is 90% of the growth in the labor force in the country between now and, and 2050 will be from immigrants and their children. The rest of us aren't even having enough babies to replace ourselves. Women now have 1.9 babies. That's not enough. Well, I'm not telling everybody to go home and have a good afternoon, but, <laughs> but we're in the same place that Italy is and Japan is and a bunch of other people are. Without, without immigration, we become Japan. We become stagnant. And it's a hard fight. I understand the, the, the politics behind it. We also have a world where salaries have uh, stagnated. I'll show you a chart, better chart in a minute. The other thing we're saying is we're graying. There's a whole bunch more older people, right? And that seems pretty obvious to everybody. The problem with it is that the average 
total retirement today of baby boomers is $112,000. That's how much they have on average. And they're going to live 25 years or so after they retire. What's going to happen? Well, the standard of living of a whole lot of people is going to drop, and that's going to mean consumption is going to drop and a bunch of other things. We're already seeing home ownership rates dropping pretty dramatically. And the one that I just think is fascinating, rental rates. Look who's renting more. Old people. Why are they renting more? They're having to sell their house in order to sustain their lifestyle. Jobs have also changed a great deal. Today, if you're uh, college educated, you didn't even have, you never got to 5% even in the depths of the recession as an unemployment rate, but you're in heavy demand, 2.5% unemployment, 4% 4 is considered full. But if you don't have a high school degree, you're still running 7% unemployment. And if you're young and don't have a high school degree, it's triple that. Pay since the 1960s for men has stayed flat. One of that, one of the reasons, is that we've lost good manufacturing jobs. Women were doing pretty well up until about 2000. Reason for that is they're getting more educated, but their pay is also stagnated during that period of time. And we have the great chasm of mismatch. How many people in the room have trouble finding good employees? Raise your hand. Yeah, I mean, wait, we have, the, the, the data says that two million manufacturing jobs right now are trying to find somebody. So we have people looking for work and we have people who cannot find work. My favorite uh, cartoon recently is I'm going, you know, this fall I'm going to a trade school to be a welder. I, my starting pay is 50000 This guy says I'm going to a pricey four-year school with liberal arts degree. I'm going to make 25000 The other guy's a loser. I mean, we've got a, we've got a situation where we, we've changed the, the expectation. So I want you to think about this question for a minute. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I'm going to say everybody stand up. Just stand up for a minute for me. I'm going to ask you to vote. So the question is, by 2022, what percentage of the jobs in America in 2022 are going to need a four-year degree, BA, BS, in order to qualify for the job? So if you think that number is more than 50%, I want you to sit down. If you think it's more than 40%, sit down. We're using Bureau of Labor Statistics, by the way. If you think it's more than 30%, sit down. 25%, sit down. So somebody give this gentleman a prize. The answer is 23%. 23% of the jobs that we expect to have in 2022 will need a four-year degree. Now, I'm going to make this really clear since there's reporters in the room. I think that's terrible. I think it's terrible for two reasons. One is it'd be a lot, we know how wages and incomes are tied to that. We need more people with higher degrees and higher wages. We can't find enough people in certain skill sets. We can't find enough engineers. Can't, can't find enough welders. Can't find enough engineers. We have a real mismatch. But the illusion that all the jobs are going to need a four-year degree is just an illusion. Every job is going to need higher skills. The McDonald's job needs higher skills. But everybody isn't looking at a four-year degree. In fact, when you look at service work jobs, what's happened over the last few decades is the need for more complex communication and expert thinking, critical thinking, has gone up, and all the routine cognitive stuff has gone down. So I'm not saying for a minute that you shouldn't get your child, your employees, everybody more and more skill acquisition. But as of today, and this gets me in trouble with the people who say everybody ought to go to college, I think everybody ought to have as much skills as they can possibly get. If college is your thing, great. But if tomorrow 70% of our workforce had a BA and we needed 22 or 23% of those, what would happen to the jobs for people with college degrees? They go down dramatically. And you're already seeing that in some fields. You know what an adjunct professor makes at West Virginia University to teach class? I mean, if they teach six classes a year, they're not making as much as that kid who's going to be the welder by a long shot. So here's a, here's a question. I, I put at the bottom of this that there is no source I made this up. So I want to make sure that I'm clear about it. I've made it up. I did. I've made it up. But the question is, since we're having this problem, is it that the skills have gone up 
fact, you know, that you as employers have raised your expectations faster than people are able to meet, or is it that we're doing a bad job of training them? Now, I don't know the answer to the question. I don't think anybody does. But if your skill needs are here and people can only get to here, then we've got an issue. If, in fact, we're just not doing it well, then we have to change the way we do education and skill training. And I don't know what the issue is. I mean, I, I can't tell you that answer, but if, it, if it's that people just aren't smart enough, motivated enough, whatever the word is, then we have a real issue. What that issue does is get more complicated in a world where, where more and more people are gig economy or 1099 economy or freelance or whatever term you like. But the world has started, some, many, many of you in the room already use temp employees or part-time employees or contract employees. That's more and more what the world's like. And that's leading us to the, to the next thing, which is we have, we're in a technology conundrum. We, uh, we remember the Jetsons, right? The Jetsons were, you know, wristwatches. The Jetsons, by the way, are 1962. Uh, they were projecting 2062, so we're a little past halfway. And all that stuff, you know, the little thing that vacuums as it runs around your house and reading newspapers on your iPad, we've gotten to all this stuff, everything but the flying car, right? But George had a two-day-a-week job that he only worked a couple hours a day because robots made it where we didn't need any of those people. And he had a middle-class lifestyle. We haven't got our arms around that yet, that we want to pay people the same wage and they only have to work four or five hours a week. Several of you just went hot. Damn, this is, this is, we hadn't got there yet. We are, if you want to read one book on the subject that's easily to read, it's Rise of the Robots. Uh, Martin Ford's book is great. Um, if you want to read one that's harder than the second machine age, is a, is a harder book but more, more uh, detailed. Everybody's on this kick because, you know, we figured out this is 1953 where uh, is automation going to get rid of your job? You know, do we get rid of the dull jobs, the dangerous jobs, the dirty jobs? What's automation going to do? So today, manufacturing looks like that. Where are the people? But waiting tables looks like that. Food prep. We make machines now with the manual dexterity and the, the visual acuity to make food. That's open heart surgery. We know what that one is, right? These are can these are jockeys in Dubai. We have robotic jockeys in Dubai. I do not know how this works. You know, that's before virtual reality came in, and this is me five years from now at your at your conference. I don't know why I'm, you know, I don't have to drive up the mountain, I'll just show up here as a hologram. It'll be great. There's a whole lot of data out about the probability that, that a robot could displace your job in the next few years. And if you're a telemarketer, any, any accountants in the room? My wife's an accountant, and the odds are that almost all of you will disappear. Now, down here at the bottom, if there are any dentist or clergy, no, no chance. So the good news is you're probably not on Sunday morning going to hear a robot, which is, I think, good. Economists are 50-50. We're in the middle. Who knows? We've seen this as robotics have come into your businesses. This is the number of jobs in manufacturing. We know some jobs were, were outsourced, and that's an issue. We know other jobs were automated. And so we've gone from about 19 million jobs in manufacturing to about 12 in the country. Since the recession ended, manufacturing jobs have risen about 6%. Look at manufacturing output. This is the industrial robot side of the world. So we've got these big disruptions. There's another book for you that uh, Dobbs wrote on. This is not an ordinary disruption. This is really systemic around urbanization and technological change and complexity of connections. So when I look at manufacturing today, the, if you're trying to look around the corners, and I'd ask any of you to, to during the Q&A, if you don't agree with this, tell me. But robots and automation are more and more part of what you do. They are all around the world. It's why China is not going to be competitive in a lot of manufacturing, because as a political system, they, they got to put people to work or they don't get to stay in power. And so fewer people in manufacturing jobs make it tough for them. The connectivity, the Internet of Things, the sensors, uh, what people call it, the, the digital mesh that's overwhelming uh, manufacturing, where everything's integrated and talking to everybody, going to be part of every one of y'all's operations. Analytics, who knew that a statistics major now would be highly in demand around the world? Have anybody here started with augmented reality for their employees yet? 
Anybody having real-time data or, or, or goggles that have printouts and stuff on them? You're seeing them. This is the next big wave is how can you give employees real-time information while they're doing their task so that you can see exactly what's being done. And with visual computers and automation, you can watch, the computer can watch every employee doing what they do to catch all the mistakes as they're doing it in real time. Talent issues, you're going to have fewer employees. They're going to be more and more important to you especially as a bunch of you have waves of people my age washing out of the, the workforce. And then finally, you know, your, your customers are already doing e-commerce. I have a textile company that we interviewed for a project um, where the customer emails the specifications to the machines who reprogram. These are customized shower curtains, everything from shower curtains to napkins, where they imprint and they digitally send the stuff in. And there's nobody in the middle. There's a quality control guy at the end, but you've got a customer doing e-programming of your own machinery. Around the world, economically, we're in slow to moderate growth and we're there for the foreseeable future. It doesn't matter who's president, by the way. I mean, I guess things could get worse, but you know, they're not gonna get remarkably faster in a global economy that's already the throttle. There's gonna be more globalization and urbanization and prosperity is going to remain uneven. If you think about the, you know, prosperity today is not a, it's not a political policy thing as much as it is. We have people with high, we need high demand skills. We don't have enough of them, so we pay them more. We have a lot of people with average or lower skills. We have too many for the jobs we have, so we pay them less. And that's the nature of what's spread out around our world. Rapid technological change, and that's everything. That's, you know, my bank now lets me make deposits using my smartphone with a picture. So I don't even have to go to the, you know, I mean, I don't know when I've been in a bank, but I can just take a picture of the check, you know. If Rebecca sends me a check, I take a picture of the check, it goes in the bank, they send me a picture of the receipt, I'm done. I mean, so if you think about how the world has changed, technology changes at all, we're going to get older, we're going to live longer, and that has implications for all of us and also for the type of products that we make. If we think the federal or the state or the local government is going to find our way out of our current issues with money, then I would tell you that that's probably not going to happen. We don't see local governments, state governments, or federal governments having more resources anytime soon. Now, you know, we can we have a good discussion on how you pay the debt back and how you do this and whatever. But if anybody here thinks that all of a sudden there's just going to be a whole bunch more money to solve problems, I don't believe it. Military is reorganizing and will over the next dozen years or so, and that will impact military stuff around the country. And, you know, I don't know if we'll bite the bullet and, and downsize and base realign in a real aggressive way, but there will be as there needs to be more money for older people and pensions and other things that are formula built in, we'll change formulas too, I think, but as there's more of the budget eaten up there, and at least in the short run, more eaten up paying debt service, there will be less, and the military will become a lot more automated as we go. There's continuing energy transformation. Y'all know that all too well here. Uh, I don't see a straight line. I mean, who's in, anybody in the gas business in the room? I mean, has there ever been a line in gas that didn't do this? I mean, that's gas. Now, I think people think that it's evened out a little bit because of the nature of, of the, the supplies now. But I paid 211 for gas yesterday morning, and North Car Carolina is the highest, I think one of the highest gas taxes. In South Carolina now, I'm under two bucks for a gallon of gas. Anybody here five years ago would have taken that bet? Everybody, right? I'm going to pay you less than $2 for a gallon of gas. Nobody would have believed that. Nobody would have believed that uh, today I'm having arguments in some states over displacement of sweet potato fields by solar panels. You know, the ag people say, oh, we're, you know, you're displacing sweet potato. And the farmer's going, yeah, but I'm making 10 times as much money with these solar panels and I don't do anything. I mean, it's a reorganization. And finally, for people, Wages are going to continue to grow for those jobs and those people who are in the most demand, high-skilled areas. But for most of the rest of the world, we're going to see pretty flat, 
praises because productivity growth has been relatively slow for a while in the U.S., and you've probably seen that in your businesses. And if you're going to really grow, you're either going to have to do it population-wise. We're not going to grow fast population. Productive-wise, and maybe industrial robotics will do that. Um, or you're going to have to do it in some way that is market share. And you're going to export and you're going to do things, but the world's a pretty tough place out there these days. And we're starting to see even some people not sure that uh, it's not better to, to solidify their domestic markets. So I think that overall that's the type of future we're expecting. I think for West Virginia, and I'll go off script for a second, um, there are a lot of places that have been in the country uh, energy places. Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, uh, none of them have stayed just energy places. They've all diversified. They've all spread their risk out further. They've all tried to invest in different areas. And I think that investing in technology and as a state, your manufacturing does pretty good here. From a, man, you know, from a productivity standpoint and other things, I think you're going to be able to, uh, to diversify. We talked about tourism at lunch here. You know, you've got a gorgeous state. I mean, and I know that you don't, any of you drive around the Midwest a lot, and I'm not picking on the Midwest, but I mean, you don't get the stuff you get here. Uh, you're close to a whole lot of people, uh, and especially to your east, that have a great deal of disposable income. And I think that your overall issue is how do we diversify the economy by bringing more wealth from outside in? How do we maximize the energy economy that we have? It isn't going away. It's smaller, but it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, and how do we become more competitive as a state as we compete for jobs against surrounding states in the, in the upper part of the south or the, the western part of the eastern seaboard? I think there are lots of ways to do that. I don't think that there's anything about West Virginia's current situation that is at all, you know, woe is me, my mother would say, is a pity party, and that's not what it is. It's about how do you reinvigorate uh, an economic direction that allows you to continue to grow, both in the things you're already strong at and, and the things that you can be strong at in the future. So I'll stop and uh, see if there's a couple questions, if Rebecca says it's okay, and uh, thank you very much. So questions. Somebody ask a hard one. Questions? On those predictions at the back end, anybody think I'm cr completely crazy? Predicting the future is not hard. Ask a group what they think and just go with the average. It's easy. Right? I'll give it three or four seconds and then we'll call it a day. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Um, just to, I will make a comment. Just as uh, you, your, your, or one of your early slides, I think it was the Peter Drucker slide that talked about opinions and data. If you don't have data, all you've got is an opinion. If you turn the TV on for the next few months, uh, and for the last, seems like last forever, um, all we get is, is opinion. Uh, perhaps if some of those folks used a little data, we might get the record straight, just a thought. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for uh, for for uh, joining us today. I thought the uh, I thought that was was a fascinating uh, piece and really does show the power of of data um, versus um, opinion. Um, certainly, I saw some things that I didn't expect to see, and uh, appreciate the appreciate the uh, the opportunity to listen to that. Uh, just a reminder, again, for those of you who are members of the board, we will start at 1.30 upstairs in the, what, what room did I, 205, 205. For those of you who are registered for the dinner tonight at the Clay Center, just a reminder, that will start at 6.15 with a reception and dinner will follow at 7. Senator Manchin is uh, joining us and will be uh, a speaker tonight, so we'll look forward to that. Again, uh, thanks to all of you for, uh, for participating for the last day and a half. Uh, we think that the content this year was, was better than ever. Um, that said, we will try to do it better again next year. So thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day, and have a wonderful Easter weekend. Thank you.